Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all. Uh, again, I'm Doug Elliott. You've seen me a couple times already. Uh, I have the distinct honor of introducing our final speaker, Dr. Ben Bernanke. Uh, I'm not going to give a long introduction because if you don't already know who he is, you should not be in this auditorium. <laughs> uh, we do, however, have a bio in uh, your packet if you're interested in more details. And I'm glad David just walked in because I was about to say, if you want to know more than that, I highly recommend David Wessel's book, In Fed We Trust, in which Dr. Bernanke is a key character. Uh, I would, though, like to emphasize two points from his biography that are relevant here and you may or may not know. Uh, first is Dr. Bernanke is one of the leading academic experts in this country and has written influential academic papers on the role of banks in the economy, particularly in times of crisis when liquidity would be most relevant. Second, he's ours now. I'm very pleased that Dr. Bernanke has joined Brookings as a distinguished fellow in residence in our economic studies program. And I know I personally have been dropping his name to everyone. Uh, so he will speak uh, for a few minutes, and then I'll moderate a Q&A period with him, with the audience. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. And let me, let me start with my thanks to Brookings and to Martin Bailey and Doug Elliott for organizing a conference on a very esoteric topic, but one that is very important, and we hope it doesn't become important again in the near future, but uh, uh, it's always possible, and we need to understand it. Uh, what I thought I'd do in, a, in these short remarks is talk a little bit about um, the Federal Reserve as a lender of last resort and our experience in the crisis and uh, the implications of that for financial regulation, other regulation going forward. Now, uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile to step back a little bit. There's a lot of historians here um, and talk a little bit about financial crises in general. And a good way to do that is uh, instead of talking about the crisis of 2007, I thought I'd talk about the crisis of 1907, the famous rich man's panic, uh, the last crisis to, before the creation of the Federal Reserve, which in fact in many ways motivated creation of the Federal Reserve. Um, and what's uh, convenient for this, for this purpose is that uh, it followed the, the 1907 panic, followed the sort of standard, to my mind, many details of course, but followed the standard uh, sequencing of 19th century financial panics. Um, so I think about this as having a uh, financial panic as having five, five stages. Uh, the first stage I call losses, and more generally, uh, losses means that macroeconomic or microeconomic factors are creating significant losses to some important financial institutions. In the case of 1907, uh, on the macroeconomic side, uh, a um, recession had already begun in May of 1907. The crisis itself, the panic took place in October. There's this very spooky tendency for panics to take place in October, but in those days there was a good reason for it, which was that without a central bank to smooth out interest rates over the year, uh, in the fall when there was a demand for credit to meet um, the harvest uh, uh, credit, uh, you know, to, to pay for the uh, harvest and transport, uh, interest rates tended to spike and that created more pressure in money markets. At the micro level in 1907, um, there was a uh, famous and very colorful attempt by a number of uh, speculators to corner the stock of the United Copper Company, a corner which failed and which led to significant losses to these particular individuals who unfortunately, for the point of view of the economy, were closely associated with a number of banks and trust companies in, in New York. And so the fear, at least, arose that there had been significant losses potentially associated with these folks um, at, uh, at those companies. That led to the second uh, stage of most financial panics, which is runs. Um, as people, of course, within time before deposit insurance, as people feared that the banks and the trusts uh, associated with uh, these gentlemen uh, were potentially uh, in, in significant loss. Um, there were runs both on the banks uh, and on the trusts um, as depositors pulled out their, uh, their money. Now, interestingly, um, the, the trusts, 
uh, were sort of the shadow banks of the time. They were less regulated and they were somewhat more speculative and they were not as much part of the club as the regular banks were. And uh, the, the banks in New York, um, uh, their clearinghouse, their association, uh, temporarily shut down the banks and uh, J.P. Morgan, the individual, not the, <laughs> not the company, um, uh, he and his colleagues uh, looked at the banks, uh, said that they were strong and uh, helped restore confidence in the banks and, and the banks uh, reopened and the runs in the banks stopped. But the uh, runs on the trust companies, which J.P. Morgan initially didn't deign to um, inter intervene with, continued. And on October 22nd, the largest of these shadow banks, one of the largest, the Knickerbocker Trust, failed. Uh, and uh, that was an important trigger. So losses, runs, third, fire sales is the third stage. As companies come under pressure, uh, as they lose their short-term funding, they begin to dump assets. In the case of Knickerbocker Trust, they were calling stock loans, for example, and that in turn created uh, uh, pressure on the stock market, which uh, dropped very sharply, and other asset prices came down as banks and trust companies trying to raise liquidity were dumping assets on the market. Fourth stage is contagion, uh, both through asset price declines, which put the financial position of, of uh, financial institutions into worse condition and through the interconnection between firms that are in trouble and other firms that are their counterparties and their creditors, uh, the contagion spreads from the, uh, in this case, the Knickerbocker Trust to the trust and back to the banks, uh, which remember the, um, uh, the initial work by J.P. Morgan and his friends had, um, had stabilized. Um, so the, the, the crisis, uh, uh, sharpened again, and uh, the fifth stage is economic impact, and, and as was the case in a number of uh, 19th century banking panics, there was a significant impact on transactions, on credit, on normal business operations, and there was a pretty significant uh, effect, not only locally, but of course uh, a pretty significant recession that went on into the middle of the, of the subsequent year. Now, as you probably know, um, J.P. Morgan and his buddies, including Benjamin Strong, who would become the first real leader of the Federal Reserve, um, decided that enough was enough and they needed to address the trust problem as well. And so they became a private lender of last resort. They lent cash and they took additional steps also. They, um, they imposed guarantees. Um, they helped uh, strengthen firms that needed strengthening. And they did disclosure. They put information out so that people would regain confidence. And, and uh, collectively, they were able to stop, to, to stop that crisis. So um, uh, it was a, an interesting uh, illustration of the main, main uh, points of a financial crisis. And of course, from our point of view, it's very interesting because it led to the founding of the Fed in 1913 as Congress contemplated the, the, uh, the problems inherent with having a private group of individuals essentially function as the central bank in the economy. Now, the original mission of the Fed, and I, I sometimes say that after the recent crisis that the Fed has gone back to its roots because the original mission of the Fed, it did talk about uh, uh, smoothing uh, interest rates, elastic currency, and so on, but it didn't really talk about what we would think of as monetary policy. What the mission, original mission of the Fed was, was essentially to be a lender of last resort. And implicitly, the, the uh, philosophy was the Badgett uh, uh, lend freely at a penalty rate idea that uh, there come times when there's a panic, there's a hunger for cash, and the central bank can provide that cash against collateral and, and cause the, uh, the panic to, to calm. Um, by the way, just a couple of comments on that, because I'm going to come back to the Badgett principle in the context of the Fed. Um, Lending freely, we understand what that means. You know, lend to this man and that man, as uh, Badges said. But what do you lend against? And uh, I think the, the spirit of lending freely is that you should lend uh, against a broad range of assets. And you can't lend strictly on fire sale prices either, the very lowest prices, because if you do, you're not really helping anything, because they can always get the fire sale prices in the market. And so there's a sense in which the Badget principle uh, says that you should lend at a, at a price which may be something closer to what a normal market would produce for that asset. And how do you determine that? I'll come back to that. 
Another part of that phrase which gets a lot of attention and I think is not fully understood is the add a penalty rate part. And the general view of people is that well, what Badgett was saying was that you should lend at a high rate so, that, so to eliminate moral hazard and so that only the people who really quote unquote needed the money would come and take it. I don't think that that's entirely an accurate characterization of what Badgett meant or how we should think about it. What Badgett was, uh, at least one of the things he was concerned about was the fact that in his day, um, the money supply was constrained by the gold standard and the central bank could not create an indefinite amount of money. And so uh, a higher rate was just a way of dissuading uh, what could turn into a, a, a domestic run on banks, could turn into a run on the currency, a run on the gold standard, if there was fear that the, uh, um, the gold standard was not being maintained. So that was an important concern. I would also argue that, uh, again, that the penalty rate, if the penalty rate is higher than the rate prevailing in markets in the panic, again, it's not going to do much good. So you need another concept of penalty rate, and I would argue that an appropriate concept is a rate that's higher than normal, but maybe lower than the, the fear rate that's, uh, that we're seeing. Well, let me uh, uh, come back now to the, of course, the more recent crisis and talk about it in the context of these general principles. Um, I think, you know, now looking back and even in, in the middle of the crisis, I think we, we recognize that the 2007-2009 crisis met essentially the five criteria, the five stages of the classic financial panic. Um, losses, macroeconomic stresses, subprime lending, mortgage losses, other types of real estate losses, all those things were happening, of course, and were generating losses of unknown magnitude at a wide range of financial institutions. Runs, uh, not depositors, of course, but in this case, wholesale funding, whether it was repos, a commercial paper, um, funding that was uninsured and was pulling back from companies uh, in the crisis. Third, fire sales. There was a lot of uh, pressure on downward on asset prices, stock prices, as companies dumped assets um, that they couldn't finance, and that created a additional pressure on other com companies leading to the fourth stage, which was contagion, as uh, the combination of de depressed asset prices, the interconnections, and the opacity of the relationships between the troubled firms and other firms meant that uh, confidence fell very severely, even on firms that there was no demonstrable uh, fear of, of insolvency at the, at the moment. Uh, and then finally, of course, the broad economic effects, which uh, we, all, we all know about and are still trying to address. Now, I think a, a fair question would be, well, if this was such a standard thing, why, why didn't we recognize it sooner? And there are a couple of answers to that. One, uh, not, not excuses necessarily, but explanations, if you will. Uh, one is that it has to do with the first principle, which is that the, uh, a panic is set off when people believe that there are significant losses to financial institutions, not just losses, but losses to critical financial institutions. And early in the crisis, um, the general view was that even though house prices might be coming down quite a bit, that this was not in kind all that different from the tech bubble bursting. The loss of paper wealth, that would affect consumer spending, it would slow the economy, but neither we, the regulators, nor the banks themselves appreciated their exposure to mortgage losses. And indeed, uh, in the 2008 transcripts which just came out, uh, I think Eric Rosengren is quoted as saying that we talked to all these big banks and we asked them, what would happen if house prices dropped 30 percent? And they all said, ah, nothing, nothing much. So it took a while to figure out that the banks were as exposed as they turned out to be to these losses. So that was one thing that we were slow to see. The other thing we were slow to see was to recognize the, um, the fact that uh, runs were a different animal now. They weren't uh, depositor runs like in uh, Wonderful Life or Mary Poppins or one of those other classic films. Uh, instead, it was a, a, an invisible run of repos and commercial paper and so on, shortening the maturity, raising their rates, and ultimately even pulling back from firms. So it took time to see the, um, the basic principles of a financial panic taking place in a, in a different institutional context, and I think that was one of the issues. Now, the other challenge that the Fed and other central banks faced was that even though we sort of know what to do in a financial panic, and the first thing you do is act as a lender of last resort, and that's the first thing we did on August of August 2007, both the, the Fed and the ECB were aggressive in putting out cash, but there were some uh, important uh, concerns. Uh, 
The first was that um, the changes in the financial system had left our legal authorities behind. The, uh, what the Fed was created to do was lend to banks through the discount window. Um, but of course, the maturity transformation process was now taking place through all different kinds of, of, um, of financial institutions. And as a result, um, the Fed had to use its 13.3 authority to lend to money market funds, to asset-backed securities, to commercial paper, um, to uh, primary dealers, et cetera. Uh, in other words, expanding the basic principle of, of lender of last resort to a much broader set of, uh, of, um, um, of firms and, and markets. The other problem, one I think that, um, I don't think Badgett talks about it enough, I'm not sure, maybe an expert here can tell me, is the problem of stigma, which is a very significant problem and was a problem early on in trying to get banks to take money from the discount window, uh, particularly if you set the, the discount rate too high above market rates, and that's the reason I think you can't do that, is that firms are very reluctant to take cash because they're afraid of being identified as weak, and, uh, and that would, of course, be counterproductive from their point of view. Now, we actually did a number of things um, to try to address stigma, and I I think some of them, there are some pretty clever uh, solutions there. For example, uh, the term auction facility, the TAF, auctioned discount window money to banks, but it was through an auction process. And because it was an auction process, banks could say, well, we're just taking, you know, it was a fixed amount that's being auctioned, and the price would be whatever was necessary to get people to take it. And if nobody was willing to take it, then the price would be low, and people would say, well, it's just a good economic decision to take this money. Moreover, the TAF, uh, didn't put out the money immediately. It, it was a delay between the winning the bid, winning the auction, and when the money was put out. And so that reduced the sense that the bank was desperately reaching for cash. It, it was just an economic transaction. So there were various things that we did to try and address the, uh, uh, the stigma. Um, and broadly, uh, I would say that uh, ultimately the the response uh, fit very well in the pattern of J.P. Morgan. There was lender of last resort activity. It was followed, though, by guarantees, by recapitalization, by disclosures, all the same steps that worked in 19th century uh, financial panics. Um, there were a couple of other issues I guess I would just uh, mention briefly. One has to do with um, the rescues of AIG, Bear Stearns, et cetera. I think those are very different. Th those, those were not, in our minds, were not... Uh, standard badger type activities. Those were ad hoc responses to a particular problem, which was that the United States does not have, or did not have, and is moving in the direction of having, but did not have at the time, a mechanism for unwinding a large financial firm in a way that was safe for the broader financial system. And as a result, the Fed used various lending authorities to try to prevent uh, the failure of, of uh, firms. Addressing moral hazard as best we could by, by for example, uh, trying to arrange it so the, so the equity holders lost most of their, their value. But that was not, I wouldn't call that a badgered activity. I think that was uh, really a, um, um, a, uh, a different thing. It was an ad hoc response to a lack of a, a necessary authority when it's being addressed. The other thing I would comment on just about, the, uh, about this whole period is that uh, frequently in discussing lender of last resort activity, people talk about the distinction between illiquid and insolvent firms. And I think while there are clearly illiquid firms that you can identify as being illiquid, and there are clearly insolvent firms that you can identify as being insolvent, I think in a crisis there's a lot of gray area in the middle. And the problem is that, you know, a firm that's insolvent at current market prices, if those are fire sale prices, there's a little bit of a question about whether it's an illiquidity issue in the general market or whether it um, uh, really is a genuine case of insolvency. Well, let me talk just for a minute. Uh, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. So let me talk just a minute about the regulatory response. Of course, uh, you know, a very extensive regulatory response to the crisis. Let me just talk about two things that are relevant to our discussion today. One is the changes in the lender of last resort authorities, and the other is uh, liquidity regulation. On lender of last resort authorities, um, the discount window remains in place. The Fed's discount window was not changed fundamentally by Dodd-Frank, but there were new disclosure requirements, and I'll come back to that. On 13.3, the Emergency Lending Authority, there were some changes made. First, and very importantly, 13.3 uh, can only be invoked uh, 
for a broad-based program lending to a class of firms or a class of market participants. It cannot be used anymore to address a single firm. Uh, that was a very important change. Secondly, uh, use of 13.3 requires approval of the Treasury Secretary. Third, uh, there are tougher credit uh, restrictions now in terms of the, in, in the crisis, the, the criterion was secured to the satisfaction of the Reserve Bank, and now there's a tougher criterion for um, whether or not the, the loan is uh, credit worthy. And finally, tougher disclosure and reporting rules have been added. Now, what does this all do? I think that um, uh, some of it, uh, some of these changes are, are, are positive. Um, for example, the restriction to broad-based uh, lending programs. I think as long as that comes with a way to deal with failing uh, financially critical firms, uh, that's fine and that's good. It takes the Fed out of the business of, of weekend uh, emergencies. Um, and of course, Dodd-Frank includes the Ori Liquidation Authority, which is a way to uh, wind down a uh, uh, financial firm uh, in a safer way. And I think a lot of progress has been made on putting that uh, OLA authority into, into practice, and we can certainly talk about that. But I think, th th as I mentioned before, the, the use of the lending authority to try to prevent uh, disorderly collapses of firms was not genuine LOLR, in my opinion, lender of last resort, and I'm glad to see that those two authorities are, are broken apart. The approval of the Treasury Secretary, I think, is basically okay for democratic reasons, and because, generally speaking, the Treasury Secretary and the Fed Chairman see pretty much eye to eye and trying to prevent the financial system from collapsing. I found that out in a number of contexts. Uh, now, there, there are a couple of other things. The other rules, though, I think are kind of two-sided. So there's the tougher repayment standard and there's a tougher disclosure. Both of these things are very understandable from the point of view of taxpayer responsibility, accountability, democracy, governance, et cetera. But they do potentially raise some concerns about the use of these authorities in the next crisis. On, in, in the case of the um, tougher repayment standard, um, as I mentioned, and the reason I mentioned it was that uh, the distinction between insolvency and illiquidity in a crisis is not always so clear. And sometimes judgments have to be made. And if the, if the standard of repayment is so tough that, you know, people, that the central bank is afraid to make loans in a, in a panic, that, that would be, of course, uh, unfortunate. Uh, likewise, on the disclosure requirements, again, totally understandable from the perspective of governance and accountability, but we already have pretty significant uh, stigma problems, and of course, the more quickly and more actively these uh, loans are disclosed, the worse those problems are going to be. So again, I'm not, let me be clear, I'm not saying these were mistakes or, or they're problems. Uh, they have obviously good reasons for these uh, changes, um, but uh, there are some potential downsides to the disclosure and uh, credit restrictions. The other area, and it's the last thing I'll just talk about very briefly, the other area, of course, is the imposition of liquidity reg regulations on a number of different firms. The, the fact is now that what we saw in the crisis was that um, the lender of last resort uh, privilege has been extended very broadly in the economy, wherever there's maturity transformation. And in order for that to be consistent with uh, not creating too much moral hazard, there's got to be, of course, uh, prudential requirements for, for liquidity. And so we're seeing, as you discussed already in this meeting, and I won't go into it, but the, the, the Basel III, I think one of the most important innovations in Basel III besides strengthening the capital requirements is, is the addition of uh, various liquidity requirements. I guess what I would, uh, I would just uh, point out is that the Basel uh, liquidity rules uh, are only part of what's happening in terms of liquidity regulation. There are a number of other ways in which liquidity is going to be uh, part of the oversight. For example, the bank stress tests that the Fed conducts are going to have a liquidity component as well as a capital component. Um, the Fed is discussing uh, surcharge, capital surcharges for firms that rely too much on short-term uh, unsecured funding. Uh, margin and collateral requirements are being increased quite considerably, so that, of course, is a, is a liquidity requirement. Uh, reg, uh, and on, this, on the supply side, on the, on the sources of liquidity, of course, regulation of money market funds and repo is a very hot topic, and uh, trying to, again, from the supply side, reduce the risk of a run uh, or a panic is, is a very important set of rules uh, happening. And finally, liquidity regulation of financial market utilities like exchanges and central counterparties is also uh, 
very extensive. So uh, one of the really major changes in financial regulation coming out of the crisis is recognition that um, the lender of last resort uh, power or uh, privilege has been extended very broadly, and that requires a lot of um, actions to make sure that um, uh, that that privilege is not uh, doesn't result in excessive uh, doesn't result in inadequate liquidity in the point of view of of, of, of firms. Many tough questions there. Um, for example, uh, how do you treat uh, your collateral you hold at the central bank? Does that count as liquidity? That's been a big source of contention in the debate. Uh, another question is, do firms always have to hold the liquidity or are they allowed to draw it down? If they're not allowed to draw it down, you have what's called the last taxi at the railroad station problem. The rule that says there always has to be one taxi at the railroad station means that, of course, the second one is really the last one, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and by the same token, the requirement that liquidity always has to be above a certain level basically means that you don't have any liquidity at all because you can't use the liquidity that you have. So there are a lot of issues there to be resolved, but uh, I think that uh, this is to end. Uh, the, the crisis has brought back uh, liquidity and lender of last resort activity in a very big way, and it's going to affect both the activities of central banks and uh, a wide range of financial regulations. Thank you. Uh, and I will mostly leave time for the audience because I know you have limited time. But uh, I do want to ask one question, uh, and you clearly can't answer this in full, but just conceptually, how do you think bank liquidity requirements should be designed? How, how do you decide what the right balance is and how to operationalize it? Well, one of the um, innovations in general in bank regulation uh, that's followed from the crisis is the use of stress testing. The stress testing is not a new idea. I mean, it's been around for a long time, but there is a sense, at least, I may not be entirely accurate, but there's a sense that uh, in the past that the fact that sort of recent um, development, in a period where recent developments were fairly, you know, uh, stable, mm -hmm. uh, that that led to excessive uh, optimism about the risks of, of, of some kind of shock occurring. And so stress testing has come in. Mm -hmm. um, and most, if you look at the way Basel III uh, calculates the uh, uh, HQLA, the li li high quality liquid asset requirements, et cetera, most of them are based on stress test concepts. You know, what, how much do you need to hold in order to, how much liquidity do you need to hold um, in order to meet 30 days of you know, certain very difficult circumstances? Now. There's a lot of really challenging questions here. You know, for example, the liquidity of a particular asset might depend on market conditions or on what's happening in the broader economy. Um, likewise, uh, changing liquidity rules is probably going to have general equilibrium effects on, on what kinds of liquidity is available and how liquid it is and what the markets, uh, how, how the markets function. So it's a, it's a tough problem. It's going, to take some, um, it's going to take some experimentation. But I think the stress test approach is probably the one that's... Um, uh, it's got the most uh, support at this point. One more quick question, and if this isn't something you've looked into, if you can pass on it, I'll go to the audience. I, I've been asking the various economists how they view the societal value of maturity transformation, because there doesn't seem to be a very good theory about what amount of benefit is out there from being able to take these deposits and turn them into longer-term investment. Well, Let's, let's be careful, let's separate. Maturity transformation is an important function. You, you, people, you need to be able to get cash, mm -hmm. right, uh, 
even though most of the investments of the society are in longer term assets. So you have to have maturity transformation. The interesting question is, to what extent uh, do you need all the financial structure that we have now providing maturity transformation, and what extent could it be done, for example, through narrow banks and those things? I can't really answer. That's a big question. Take a lot to think about. But I guess I would, I guess I would say that um, I'm a little bit skeptical that you could, for example, uh, you, I mean, in theory, you could make maturity transformation entirely of uh, the responsibility of the government. Mm -hmm. You know, it could issue, it could issue treasury bills, and that's essentially backed by long-term taxation. Uh, but then that overwhelms a number of other public finance functions mm -hmm. and uh, also means that the government has to get in the business of uh, checking accounts and things of that sort. So moreover, I don't think that would uh, mean that the uh, firms that are financed by longer term debt are still, they would still require, I think, safety and soundness oversight and so on. It's a complicated and very interesting issue and been around for a long time. Maturity transformation in general is very important and it's something the financial system does. I think. A challenging question is how much of what the financial system does arises from genuine demand for maturity transformation, how much arises from some kind of moral hazard problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very provocative. Uh, okay, questions from the audience. Sure, uh, all the way in the back there. Thank you. Uh, simple question. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis everything you just I, said. I, I'm sorry, could you identify yourself? Oh, sure. Roger Hanish. Uh, thank you very much. Vis-a-vis -vis everything you've said regarding the banks too big to fail, and now they're getting bigger and bigger. What's your thought on that? Well, um, there's a number of parts of the uh, of the regulatory uh, revamp that meant, uh, is intended to address that. Um, one in particular is the the most important one, probably, is the orderly liquidation authority. If that can be made to work and uh, we're certainly moving in the right direction, and uh, that would take away the too big to fail privilege, and that would mean that the calculation of how big a bank should be would depend on genuine economic criteria rather than on the too big to fail privilege. Uh, so that's an important one. But th there are other things that uh, the, the regulatory system is trying to do to make banks internalize, in some sense, the cost to the society of their size and complexity for example, uh, capital surcharges on larger banks, um, the fact that many of the tougher regulations apply to only large and complex institutions, not to smaller institutions. Um, so the problem is obviously not solved yet. Uh, and I would have to say also, it's not just, it's not just size. You know, there's some pretty big institutions which I don't really consider, you know, not nearly the same, don't pose the same risk that Lehman Brothers did, for example, that are bigger than Lehman Brothers. And I think it has to do also with opacity, complexity, interconnectedness, uh, and a variety of other things. So it, it's, it's, it's harder than just saying, you know, putting a size limit or something like that. But a lot of the Dodd-Frank and Basel uh, reforms are aimed at making it more costly and taking away some of the privilege of being, quote, too big to fail, with the hope that over time, that as that subsidy is eliminated, that decisions we made based on economic criteria and not on moral hazard criteria. Paul? Um, thank you very much. Uh, someone observed that one of the other common elements of crises across time has been uh, the common shock sort of uh, risk, and particularly with respect to real estate. To the best of your knowledge, has sort of have policymakers ever considered asset concentration sort of limits? or anything that would limit the exposure to a particular asset class versus counterparty limits or things of that sort. And what do you think about that idea generally? Well, that's a, that's a very good point. And I, 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 one of the things uh, I could have talked quite a bit about the Dodd-Frank and the, and the various, um, uh, various changes, but recall that one, I think one of the most important uh, changes in bank oversight was the stress testing. That, and uh, I think the success of the Fed stress tests in March 09 was a very important step towards stabilizing the banking system. But one of the features of the stress test is that all the big banks are stressed at the same time. So in principle, at least, and, and in practice, I think the Fed and other bank regulators are moving in this direction. You can really imagine doing uh, a, a, quote, macroprudential stress test, in other words, where you uh, give all the banks uh, a stress test in which uh, 
commercial real estate prices drop 25%. And then you can not only see what happens to each bank, but then you can try to think about the cross-bank implications. So there is a much, much more attention to that kind of consideration from a systemic, it follows from the systemic approach. And uh, it's also implicit in, for example, in the uh, counter-cyclical capital requirements that are in the Basel III. So the notion that uh, regulators are be looking for common shocks, um, innovations, product innovations, asset classes, whatever, that go across a bunch of banks, that's very much in the spirit of the new systemic approach to regulation. The others? OK, Bert, what the heck? <laughs> Uh-oh. Helen, you've got to call Helen. Um, <laughs> thank you, Bert Ely, and thank you very much for being here. Um, when we take a look at the, uh, at the various Dodd-Frank uh, reforms, one of the kind of underlying premises was that uh, central clearing mechanisms of various types would strengthen uh, the financial system. But the question that I've raised a number of times and asked, what happens if a clearing mechanism fails? Are the clearing mechanisms themselves too big to fail? Uh, if one of them ran into trouble for whether for operational reasons, fraud, or whatever, uh, uh, should they be uh, bailed out, if you will, or their liabilities protected? And if they're not, what is the consequence for the overall financial system if a cr large critical clearing mechanism, in fact, fails to perform as it's supposed to? That's a great question, and I once talked about this in a speech, and I, I guess I cited, um, I don't know if it was Tobin or whoever, but I cited the quote that, you know, if you put all your eggs in one basket, you've got to really watch that basket. Um, so obviously, uh, one of the effects of making central counterparties so important is, of course, to elevate the risk to the system if, if they were to fail. And so therefore, it's really critically important that they not fail. And what that means in practice is that they are going to be uh, very closely looked at. So in particular, Dodd-Frank gives the Fed uh, new authorities to backstop the SEC or the CFTC, whoever is the principal regulator, to make sure that the, the um, uh, central counterparties meet all the appropriate safety and soundness standards. And the Fed does have the authority, but not the requirement, uh, to be a lender of last resort to one of these uh, central counterparties. For example, if it didn't have the liquidity at the end of the day to, to meet its, its obligations. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I think the, the calculation here is that by putting uh, these transactions in central counterparties, you kind of put it where you can see it. It's more visible. Um, and uh, you're, you are concentrating the risk, but as long as the um, uh, oversight is extremely tough and very focused on these nodes, which are critical to the system, it seems like the right trade-off. But, but, but the, the point is very well taken, you know, that there's a certain amount of risk in the system. If you take it out of one place, it may go somewhere else. And that's true in a lot of dimensions, shadow banking, et cetera. And uh, this was one of the problems with the uh, tr traditional bank supervision, which was, you know, everybody had their own little part of the system, and as long as my part of the system was doing okay, I didn't care. So what's, what's good, I think, is that we're trying to move to a, a world in which um, uh, the regulators collectively are trying to look at the, the broad system and look at the systemic uh, consequences, and that would surely be a very important one. But doesn't this mean that the nodes themselves well, uh, I think the, the way you deal with uh, a, a too big to fail problem in this context is by making it extremely unlikely that it would fail, by having all kinds of backstops and so on that, that are, where the costs are borne not by the taxpayer, et cetera, but borne by, the, say, the participants. So for example, if you have the ability in a, in a crisis to essentially dun or tax all of the participants in the, counter, in the central counterparty in the, the exchange, uh, then that gives you a mechanism which is you know, incentive compatible that's consistent with uh, addressing moral hazard problems, but which makes failure extremely remote. And I think that's kind of the trade-off that regulators are, are working on. Yeah, one, uh, well, one other question based on what you were just saying. How do we deal with the non-banks in terms of liquidity issues? As you pointed out in your talk, uh, the possibility of systemic runs outside of the banks is increasingly high compared to past years. What, what can we do? 
Well, uh, as I was saying, to the extent that um, uh, in, in, say, in money market funds, for example, where there is a, uh, a liquidity risk, mm -hmm. um, you need to think that through and, and make sure that the, um, uh, either their mechanisms, say in the case of money market funds, for example, I mean, there are different ways to approach the problem. One would be to have liquidity requirements, and there are liquidity requirements, of course, right. uh, for money market funds, and the question is, are they enough, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other, though, is the other approach is to recognize that um, if, if you have a, uh, I mean, some people advocate the, the NAV, the uh, floating NAV, the net asset value, so that, that the value of the money market funds always reflects its market value. And as you know, that would eliminate the run incentive or substantially eliminate the run incentive. And so liquidity wouldn't be an issue in that respect. So, so uh, there's a lot of attention to regulating repo markets, money market funds, um, uh, other non-bank dealers, et cetera. And I think the, any, any, any institution that engages in significant maturity transformation and is subject to run risk might, and is systemically important, all those things, uh, and might therefore at some point come to the Federal Reserve and say we need cash, the time to think about that and to fix that and to provide the right incentives is not in the midst of the crisis, but at, in, in advance of the crisis in, 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 the, in, the, in the development of the rules that you're setting up to uh, govern liquidity uh, 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 practices. So, um, well, it, yeah. It, it sounds like implicitly uh, one of the things you're saying is that the answers may differ quite considerably depending on exactly what the mechanism that is that you're concerned about it. So. Well, that's right, and um, you, as always, it's you have to think about uh, what are the what's the sequence, what are the consequences, right. you know. So um, uh, you can imagine uh, certain types of small institutions. I'm not talking about banks. We're talking about uh, I don't know private equity or something, where run risk is low, or if there was a run, it would be not so consequential. That would be a lower priority, presumably. Sure. Uh, so what you're looking for is places where there is run risk, where run risk can be addressed, at least to some extent, by various liquidity practices, and where the run risk has potentially serious systemic consequences, because that's where the moral hazard comes from, because that would generate the intervention from the government. Right. Want one more? Sure. OK. One more from the audience. Yeah. Alex, Alex there. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Thank you for, for your speech, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can still call you like that. Alex Peritera, ASCGS. It's like being an ambassador, you know, for the rest of your <laughs> life. Yeah. Um, my question goes, basically, I'd like to uh, f uh, confront you with uh, one of the comments that was previously made in one of the previous panels. Uh, one of the speakers um, was basically pointing out that in the current regulatory environment, including the capital and liquidity requirements that, uh, that are being enforced, uh, there's a clear bias towards uh, big companies in terms of funding. It's much easier for big companies uh, to fund themselves. Uh, um, and and it's, uh, it's getting increasingly hard for small and medium-sized enterprises, and this is a problem that affects Europe as well, by the way, uh, to, to, get, uh, to get funds, and that the funding structure has already changed across America. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to quote as best as I can. And I wonder what your views are uh, about that and, and whether, whether you think that this is... Uh, um, there has some cyclical uh, reasons uh, that are uh, at play here, whether we are actually changing the kind of uh, financial ac um, structure and architecture in, in a way that is clearly having an impact on, on the real economy. You're talking economy. about non-financial companies getting... For non-financial yeah. non financial companies, yes. And this was uh, Steve Strongen in the previous panel was uh -huh. suggesting there had been this shift. Because the big companies can go to the bond market, the small companies go to the banks. I see. Um, well, we're, you know, uh, I think that's something that has to be watched. I don't have a really good answer to that. Um, banks are still with us. In Europe, they're much bigger relative to the economy than they are here. I think a lot of what happened to the small companies in the last few years was cyclical because there was these balance sheet, you know, very, very significant uh, weakness in the, in the balance sheets, which made them more difficult to lend to. Um, Uh, I think that uh, you know. I think that, as a general matter, we're going to have to calibrate 
as I said before, the general equilibrium effects of this. We don't know exactly how markets are going to change, how the pricing of short-term debt is going to change, um, and the cost of lending, you know, the capital cost and the total cost of bank lending. So I think that's a, that's a, a legitimate question. Um, although it's also true that more and more firms are getting access to bond markets as well. But it's something I think that's worth watching. And there's uh, uh, always a possibility of recalibrating in various ways or, or looking for alternative um, uh, institutions that can, you know, there are different, it, 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 there are other kinds of firms that can make loans to small companies besides banks, for example. Um, so I, I realize I'm not really answering your question very well, but I, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it's an important issue. Uh, it's not easy to know in advance exactly how the market will shake out, but making credit available to small companies is very important, not just for equity and community reasons, but because small companies are where a lot of employment growth comes from and where a lot of innovation comes from, and we don't want to be in a situation where uh, credit is not available to startup firms and small firms. So I think that's something we just need to watch. and. Uh, there are a lot of aspects of all, this, uh, cha all these changes uh, that we don't really fully understand what the quantitative implications are going to be. And that's why I think that this ought to be considered a work in progress as you go forward. And in particular, Basel, the Basel Committee is very explicit about the fact that you know, they're going to be putting out certain parameters and seeing how it works. And if it doesn't work, they're prepared to change, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it really is not set in stone at this juncture. Okay. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.